All right, we've finally gotten to the lofting process. This exciting step means drawing the boat full size on the lofting floor that we built. So for building the boat, these are three of the four most important pieces of the puzzle in terms of plans. So right here we have the profile view of the boat, we have the half breadth view of the boat, and we have the frame view of the boat. And these are basically like a topographical map of the boat, looking at it from basically three different angles. Let me finish this beer real quick. All right, we got a boat. So here's our boat. Now a profile view would be like if you took this boat and split it vertically, right down the middle and down the ends and opened it up so that you were looking at the guts of the boat all the way across. So if this bottle was split, sliced it all the way down, took this front piece off, laid it back on its side. That's basically your profile view. Now your half breadth view is if you took Let's see if we can draw on this. And you slice the boat this way. And if you can imagine, this line would end up being narrower than this one. And it would be the same here. So the lower in the boat you go, the closer to the keel, the narrower they are. They start to fan out as you come up. And that would be the same thing on this bottle, each one of these slices. So that's your half breath view. There's slices this way across the boat, and it's just the outer edge of those slices. Now your frame view is if you slice the boat this way. And each one of these represents one of these lines. But you're looking at them on end. So you would see just this outer edge. And these would all be like cookies that came out, if that makes sense. And that would be your frame view. So if you're building something like a house, all you really need is a profile view, because everything's 90 degrees and um, level and plumb. It, it, it's really easy to scale that up. But on a boat, you know, where do you stop in this 3D plane that you're moving? And that's where these all these points come into play. Because on the boat, if I know it in the vertical plane and I know it in the horizontal plane and I can relate that to the profile view, I can basically plot this point that's out here in space somewhere. And once we have that all drawn out and figured out on the lofting floor, it's pretty easy to pull the patterns from that and then you have your molds to build your boat around. You have your shape of your boat. So the first part of lofting is to draw a grid on a big flat floor so that you can draw these three views out. Um, and the first part of drawing the grid is drawing your baseline. And then everything else is built off of that. So we stretched a wire as tight as we could from one end to the other and marked along it with a square, so plumb straight down. Marked the table, and then we connected it with our long straight edge here. Hitting, 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 hitting. And now we have the baseline. So the next step is going to be take this wire out. And then we can go along and figure out where all our stations are going to land. And we want to avoid the seams in the plywood with the stations and preferably with the butt lines as well, the buttocks lines. And hopefully we can figure that out and get it so that the boat doesn't run off one end or the other of the lofting floor. And then I think we're on hold until those trammel points come. And then we can use those to swing arcs and start setting up our stations. But those should be here, like, I mean, literally any minute, just waiting on Home Depot. Or not Home Depot, uh, oh, is it UPS? 
So when you're erecting your grid, it needs to be super accurate because any issues in the grid are going to just mess you up through the entire build. They need to be spot on. So we used a wire to snap the baseline. And then from there, we erected our vertical points, our stations. And we did that with these handy little guys that are called trammel points. So they just screw on. And we made a plywood I-beam that oh, was like three, four feet long, something like that. And you can use that to swing arcs. So you put it on a point on the baseline, you swing it out, you'll make an arc. You go over, do it again, and where those arcs intersect is exactly 90 degrees between half the distance between the two trammel points. Um, so we used these to go down and swing all of those vertical stations. And then that gave us a very accurate lower and higher point that we can run a straight edge through and be sure that we were spot on. Okay, so here's a short explanation of how the trammel points work. First, you gotta start with a line that's gonna show you approximately where your station is going to land. Then you take the trammel points and you put one end on the station to the right or to the left of the one that you're working on. Now, keeping that point where it is, you use the other point to swing an arc crossing the line that you just drew for your station. Once you've marked that arc, you draw one coming from the other side of the station. These two marks should make an X. That is going to be the point where your station is going to be perfectly perpendicular to the baseline. Now erase the approximate line that you drew and just connect your points. Good. You do this for every single station line and that will give you your grid. They're also really handy for going back and checking them because you can set them for the distance between the stations and check them at the, the bottom and the top or um, diagonally in a bunch of different ways. So they're really great for, uh, for doing that layout. We found those to be super, super handy. Send some down. Now, a little bit about actually lofting. So if you go to the table of offsets, which is this giant grid of numbers, it'll tell you, for example, at station 11, you will go up X amount of feet, inches, and eighths of inches, and you'll make a point. And then that point will then help you find this curve that is B1. Or it'll help you find your rabbit, which is the groove that the planking sits into, or the top of your keel timber. So in that regard, it's kind of like a paint by number. So you draw the grid out and you plot all of these points, you connect those points, and when you're done, you should have a picture that looks basically exactly like this, just scaled up to full size. So <clears throat> we've got the grid laid down on the floor and we've gone over most of it in Sharpie, but some of it's a little damp, so we'll do that later. The pencil line will suffice for now. And that's what the fans are doing, just help us dry it off. So the next step is to start plotting the points. And according to our leader in this endeavor, Bud McIntosh, um, we should start with the rabbit line. So if you look at the table of offsets, which you shouldn't film too closely because we don't want people to replicate these. Um, most of these drawings you can get online and it could be enough information to build the boat for free if you really wanted to. But the table of offsets is really what you pay for. So I'm happy showing pictures of the other ones, but. This we gotta keep a little under wraps. Anyways, so we're gonna do the rabbit. And how the table of offsets works is it's a big grid and you have stations for, you have marks for all your stations. So station A, zero, one, so on and so forth, up into your stern. And then you have heights. And they show up, so in this instance, the rabbit line at station A doesn't exist. The rabbit line at station zero you see 5-10. So that means that the rabbit line is 5 feet 10 inches above the base at station 0. And then at station 1, the rabbit line drops to 4, 2, 1 quarter. So that's 4 feet 2 inches and 1 quarter. And then we go on from there. And we'll plot all of these points along the length. And then we'll, what's called springing a batten. So we'll take a thin flexible piece of wood connect all the dots, draw a line, and that should give us the curve of our rabbit, if you followed that. So once you've laid down your grid, and you've plotted all your points from the table of offsets, 
you need to connect those points with a fair curve. And to do that, use a batten. Uh, so we made our battens out of white pine for the bigger ones and white oak for the smaller ones. And you need clear straight grain wood and you make them various sizes, some square, some rectangular. But the idea is they're kind of like this ruler that they're fairly flexible. And you'll go through and you'll mark your points. So for us, we put a screw down and then we put another screw at the next point and then you bend the batten around that. So you'll end up butting it up against all of these points and making it into a curve. And then you look at that curve from every angle, high and low, and try to figure out if you think that that is a fair curve or if there's any irregularities into it. So this ruler, if left unimpeded, makes a fair curve. But if we had a point that was off, say I would a fair curve and then we pressed maybe onto that point a little bit. We end up with a flat spot where that point is, and we end up with a bulge right over here. And you can see how that deflection really ruins the arc of that curve. Or if we pull it forward, the batten, or in this case the ruler, wants to make that nice smooth curve. So the, in lofting they say the batten never lies. And sometimes the points do, because you're scaling them up from this all the way up to full size. So a tiny little, you know, 1 64th inch difference on the plans down here when you take the measurements adds up to be pretty significant on the lofting floor. So you end up using that batten to fair past the points. And maybe you have eight points and you hit six of them. But that's all kind of part of the game of figuring it out for the lofting. All right. If you're lofting a small boat, like a rowing boat or a little dinghy or anything that's short, you probably don't need a very long batten. But we're building a 38 foot boat. We needed a very long batten. So we weren't gonna get a full length batten, but we decided that we were gonna make our own. It's really hard to get a full length batten without any imperfections in it. So we ended up making a long batten by scarfing three different pieces together. All right, what do we got? Ooh. We got a couple boards, so we need to make some lofting battens. So we need wood that is clear of any knots and defects, preferably fairly straight grand and as long as possible. So I dug through the top of the wood pile the other day and this is what I came up with without digging too deep because it's kind of a pain. Now we needed to get this board back to the boathouse and being the strong men that we are, we just carried it back. So we're uh, making some lofting battens. So we've circled a couple of the defects. We have a little knot here. We've got a pair of little pin knots here. So we want to avoid these. So what we're gonna end up doing is making some thin strips of wood and that right there at that knot, that'll break. Um, or it'll create a hard spot and it won't give us a fair curve. So we're just looking down the board, see if we can find any more defects. Here's a little tiny knot. That one's small enough that it might not cause a problem. And then we got this big honker here. So we'll cut it below that, and out of this strip, we'll get a couple pieces for our battens, and then we'll scarf joint them together and make one or two really long battens. So now, Alex, if you can run this end of the board, what we wanna do is get a straight line with the grain. So you can kinda see the grain here, these longitudinal lines. So we wanna try to follow those as best we can. So if you imagine the tree, built up of a whole bunch of straws. And when we take our batten, we want it to be as long length of those straws as we can. If our batten ends up slicing across it, it becomes all these short little pieces and when you bend it, they break. So we wanna follow the grain as closely as we can. We'll strike a straight line, we'll rip it off with the skill saw, we'll take this end off, and then we can bring it to the table saw and start making the thinner battens out of it. Cool, let's do it. Before you can start cutting the board up into smaller sized pieces, it's important to run it through the thickness planer in order to have flat, smooth sides. Oh. 
16th in the Goa. parts are over with, you plane the battens one more time. Steve then built a jig in order for us to get perfect scarfs. So Alex is trying his hand at the wheel here. How's that chisel treating you? Pretty sharp, it's awesome. I was just saying I haven't had, I've never done anything like this where I've had control. It's definitely from the sharpness of the tools. Amazing the difference that the sharp tools make. Yeah. True fact. Soft pine doesn't hurt either. Yeah, that too. <laughs> All right. You know, my nose always gets runny in the fall weather. <laughs> um, cool. So now we have all the scarfs cut, and we got to glue them together. So for that. I have some chunks of grain bags from the chicken feed. We'll put that down to help keep the glue off the washing floor. We'll slather that in glue. Put one on it. We'll actually put them on their side like this. And then I got some little clamps. We'll clamp them down and then we'll clamp them down to the lofting table. And then we'll let them dry overnight. And once that's done, we can run them through the planer, the thickness planer, and bring them down to their final shape. And by cutting them oversize, if we're off a little bit, if this slides some, if this is a little too far up or a little too far down, we don't have to worry about it because we're going to bring this all down smaller anyways. So as long as they're close, as long as it's a tight glue joint, we're going to end up planing these down and everything will be uh, nice and perfectly smooth after that. But we do have to wrestle a 30 something foot batten through the planer, <laughs> which we might have to get a hand or two for. So, cool. cool. Give me a hand. Do it. After much trial and error and experience, I've come to the conclusion the finger is the ideal glue applicator. We'll slide it back and forth a little bit. Make sure we get it in all the little nooks and crannies. 
Now you want to squeeze tight enough to pull the joint together, but not tight enough to squeeze all the glue out, which is possible to do. So just until we start to see that bead rise up. With joint one done, now on to number two. Now we wait. 24 hours, we can take the clamps off, run this long limber batten through the planer a couple times, and we should be able to have a nice working batten. Hopefully it doesn't break. Lunch time? I'm hungry. Me too. Cool. Do it. Great. If you would draw all three of these on their own floor, you would need a massive, massive floor. So you draw all three of these superimposed on each other. It starts to get kind of confusing. But if you go look at our lofting floor, you'll see the boat in profile view, you'll see the boat in half breadth view, and you'll see on top of that the frame view. And they're all in different colors. Once you have all three views down, you need to compare them and make sure that your frame view matches up with your half breadth view and matches up with your profile view. And if it doesn't, you have an error somewhere and you need to go and hunt that error, um, which is very time consuming, especially doing it for the first time and trying to figure out which one you should shift and how best to shift them. Once you get all three views to be happy and fair and agree with each other, you can use those to start picking up the patterns to build your boat. And that, in a nutshell, is lofting. Oh, come on. You didn't think we were just going to end this video without showing us running this ridiculous thing through the planer, did you? This puppy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long batten. Yeah. It'll be nice. <laughs>